the vision of raising the esteem of teaching to parity of research um, has been debated, contested, but I hope gained traction over the past 20 years from the dealing reports at the end of the last century through to preparations in the rest of the UK for the Teaching Excellence Framework in 2016. But whilst a market intuition fees and competition between institutions has been chosen as a driver to raise the status of teaching in the rest of the United Kingdom, we in Scotland have followed a more enlightened path, placing enhancement and enhancement themes at the heart of teaching innovation. And this would perhaps be an appropriate moment for me to remind everyone that there is a, an invitation from Steve Olivier to all colleagues to go along to Bar One next Monday at 4.30 to celebrate um, the successful um, institutional review, um, which you'll have read about out on the internet. So that's next Monday at 4.30 in Bar One. Diana Loriard, who spoke to us in 2013 at our uh, conference, um, wrote in her 2002 book on the learning framework and the study of higher education. She, she wrote about the role of research in higher education and I think um, captured a very optimistic vision of the academic as a researcher into his or her own discipline, but also as a researcher into the teaching of their discipline. And so today, we come together to consider these questions about research, practitioner research into teaching. And I'm delighted to um, indicate that we will be celebrating the work of of colleagues on the postgraduate certificate who will be presenting to you today. So just briefly a few words on teaching and the revised postgraduate certificate. Teaching and research into teaching is at the very heart of the revised program through two of its modules, the teaching observation module and the personalised learning module which provides a platform for colleagues to undertake an investigation, an evaluation, if you like, of their own teaching practice. The PG CERT seeks to utilise a variety of assessment techniques and to, where possible, use authentic assessment tools. And that is why today it is a form of assessment which, um, for our three colleagues, but not as a um, separate and um, artificial, if you like, um, in, a, in an artificial environment, but rather in this public environment within our, our annual programme of TLE seminars. Practitioner research, I think, is the, the focus of today's, of this, today's seminar. Practitioner research focusing on the lecture theatre, the laboratory, and the classroom. And it defines research here as a process, I think, of which from evaluation through enhancement to teaching innovation. I'd like to invite now Eddie just to come up and say a few words as one of our senior fellows. Um, and his perceptions of the scholarship of teaching and learning. Right, just a few quick words before we get into the other bits and pieces of this, then I'll see you at the end to bring some other things together. The first thing to put into context is to remember that research and scholarship is a core academic function. But the advantage of teaching is that any one of us can collaborate with someone else in another area that you couldn't necessarily do because of subject discipline. So it affords greater opportunities to work with others if we focus on teaching research. And if you're going towards the UK PSF and seeking fellow and senior fellow opportunities, then some sort of research into teaching 
is going to be helpful in getting a successful completion and upgrade. The other fact is that Apertee has a really strong teaching and learning group of practitioners with high quality output recognised through, for example, the student-led teaching awards. All you have to do year on year is take a look at the number of nominations and the effort students have to put into that to realise that it is valued. So, we've got that. Our ATA membership levels are increasing, and not only increasing, people are continuing to seek to upgrade. So we've got an active body of teaching and learning practitioners, but what we need to do is find ways to support them more and more and more to do other things and keep that going. Following on from that, we need to share best practice, not just within our subject disciplines, but more widely, and not just more widely within our team, but out in the wider world. How often, if you think back carefully yourself, have you heard someone else trumpeting about their fantastic teaching and learning and what they are doing and you're thinking that we did that at Aberdeen five years ago? So, sharing our best practice, we're probably doing things we need to be able to get out there better and wider because we are possibly doing a lot of innovative upfront stuff that others are catching on to behind us. And, going for gold. There's a lot of us out there. And for those of us that have got there first, it's our duty to make sure that we help everybody else get to where we are. I've had an interesting pathway getting through to Senior Fellow, and I would like others to be able to enjoy the same experience. It has ups, it has downs, but it's worthwhile. And as a strength of university, I see it as part of my duty to make sure that others get that same <coughs> opportunity to enjoy what I've done in the classroom. Well, thank you very much, Eddie. Um, when I arrived here myself in 2013, I was really excited by um, the innovation at that time of centrally funding a series of um, ATLEF projects. Um, and I'd like Alistair to just come forward now to, to give an overview of um, what we've achieved in these past, past years. Thank you, Martin. I mean, I, I recognise that a lot of you will be quite familiar with that map, but I think it's helpful just in the context of the seminar to, to give a bit of an overview. I think a, a key point here is ATLEF is, is really very recent. Uh, October 2013 is only two and a half years old. And I, I think the other key point to make is actually there's much more uh, educational research and evaluation of, of practice that goes on that is not ATLEF funded. But having said that, we did a deal that when in, in October 2013, um, in parallel with the uh, development of the new teaching learning enhancement strategy, that if, if Amity was really serious about its, its, its goals or its pedagogy, that we needed to put a direct resource uh, in, in, into, the, in, into this area. So I say, it, these were the aims, um, designed to support the development of leading practice and build capacity in, in scholarship. I think that's a really important part, this notion of building, building capacity. There was also this notion that there was commitment to dissemination of the outcomes. We felt very strongly that the, uh, if we were going to put money into these projects, that it shouldn't just benefit the individuals involved in the project. It should have some kind of wider impact. Now, that wider impact could be uh, within your division, it might be within the university more widely, or it might even be out there, it might be at the discipline level and uh, the wider community. Um, as Martin said, they've been funded through a combination of the enhancement themes and internally, um, mainly internally, but a little bit of pump priming from the enhancement themes. They have gone through all the projects that we funded, which has been about 37 projects so far. Um, they've all gone through a strict peer review process. So I think that's really important as well, that in terms of the quality of the projects that we've funded, they've been through a strict peer review process, just as you would expect for external funding. Um, these are the, the, just to list the calls. Uh, the first one um, was, I think we funded 12 projects uh, to support the implementation of the, the then Teaching Learning Enhancement Strategy. We then moved on to reforming our curriculum. You'll see that there's, particularly reforming our curriculum, the student transitions aligns very well with the current, uh, or previous and current enhancement team. So we were, again, because we were funded by the enhancement team, we wanted to join things up, and it aligned very much with what we wanted to do. So I think we funded about eight projects 
through reforming our curriculum, another seven of the student transitions, and we've just funded five online learning projects and five student-led projects. And I just want to include this, this has been an overarching theme for us, is this notion of student engagement. In the first round of Athletic, it just happened rather fortuitously that a number of the projects needed student researchers. And it was really quite, a, that would prove to be very successful. I think the students got a lot out of it, and I think the projects got a lot out of it. And I think we got maybe fresher, in slightly different insights in some of those projects. I'm thinking, for example, student perceptions of use of technology than perhaps we might have had if we had staff researchers. So that, by the time we got to that left three, we had student engagement as one of the principles that students should just be the subject to research, but they should be active participants. And as I say, that's now evolved back to the core where we're trialling these student-led projects. And having met the uh, leads for the student-led projects last week, they're very impressive. They're very committed, and it's a really good, uh, interesting range of projects there. Okay, so in terms of impact, how we set out what we aim to achieve? Well, as I say, I always couch this in terms of it is very early days. However, you'll see that we've got projects covering a wide range of thematic areas. Details of all the projects are on the website. I think I'm right in saying all, certainly all schools have been involved, uh, and most services have been involved as well, and student associations have been involved. So a, a very large cross-section of the university community has been involved in that life. I think it's fair to say that there's a real increase in interest and expertise I mean, I remember one of my colleagues, who's quite a senior member of staff, I won't have embarrass them, but they were really, really excited when they won an APNEF project because they had a lot of experience in uh, research in their discipline, but they'd never done any educational research for them. And so that was, it was a real learning process, and they got a lot out of that. Um, so I, I am quite confident that actually it is fulfilling it, and fulfilling it seems that there is an increase in, increase in, in, in pedagogic research. The next point is just to say, I think we've catalyzed a number of new collaborations. Not all projects, but the vast majority of the other projects have been collaborative. And so I would hope that, again, those new collaborations, I mean, I met with Eddie yesterday, and that was with Gary Mulholland at the Business School. So again, new collaborations mean potential new areas of research going forward. And we've disseminated our work in a variety of ways. There have been academic papers, there's been presentations, workshops both internally but also nationally and we've been nominated for awards. So for example Siobhan McAndrew won an award uh, at Sparks last year and we've been nominated at least for the US conference with a couple of nominations for that. And they've also spurred on new initiatives. So I, I, the en Enterprise Digital Bankers last year is a nice example of that. Having said all of that, we do recognise that probably we do need to do a bit more systematic evaluation of the initiative, and actually that's something that came through in the year. The year was recognised that, that we just had the, the, the year outcomes, and that left was highlighted as good practice, but similarly I think we were encouraged to reflect and develop a more systematic evaluation to the initiative. And that's all I have to say, Martin. Thank you. Okay, well, thank, thanks, Alistair, for, for setting, if you like, the institutional scene. Um, I think building on some of the things you said there in terms of sharing and dissemination, I'd like to invite William Graham to come forward to uh, share with us his, um, his project on the PG Cert. Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Thanks very much for allowing me to speak today at this seminar. Uh, my name is William Graham is on the board of a lecture on criminology, not sociology, as Noel pointed out earlier on. Um, as part of my uh, PhD postgraduate certificate in higher education teaching, I had to do an independent study report, um, and this is the question that I chose. My past experiences in policing, enhanced research-led and practitioner-led teaching for students at the university. So from I'm just going to very quickly, what I'm going to look at is my previous experience in the police. Yes, I was a former police officer. Um, overview of the project, my pedagogical strategy. I'll talk about the methodology and the results and the conclusions that came out of it. We'll get a few slides of references at the end of it, which is really interesting. Um, 
So yes, I want to do some stuff on that. So I mean, my way to put that on the slide, uh, I've never pictured this. <laughs> um, just want to change. However, I was in Strathclyde Police for 30 years, and I managed to retire before the monster of Police Scotland came along. I left the police in 2010, and uh, I was lucky enough to be given the opportunity to carry out my PhD research at Glasgow Caledonian University looking at policy transfer of a guy's project that I've been working in the police. Um, thankfully, I uh, passed on by a couple of weeks ago and I'm just busily finishing off amendments, so um, it's been a bit of a hard slog in the past few years. So, yeah, I did survive the PhD, which everybody here has obviously already done. During my time at University of Glasgow, Glasgow Caledonian, I was um, given the opportunity to do some extra teaching, part-time teaching as part of the, the studentship. And I realised that I had quite a bit of experience that I could give to students and impart that knowledge to them um, in relation to policing and also the criminal justice system, which I've been heavily involved in. Uh, that I found guilt my teaching. I was given a job here at Aberteen in August 2014 as a lecturer in criminology. Um, and I believe some of the students do stay away during the lectures, but I think there was a policy to be um, Part of the postgraduate certificate, which I was enrolled in when I joined, I realised that there's no formal training in teaching. My background is very much professional, um, and as I said, it was very much learned on the job at GCU and also at Aberdeen when I started here. My pedagogical approach, which uh, I developed, was very much mixed methods for a blended approach, as by the talks about 2015. And I based it on the Aberdeen uh, strategic plan of teaching and learning of student-centred uh, student learning, experiential practitioner learning, uh, research-led, um, use of virtual learning environment and personal reflection, uh, all of which goes to make up my personal strategy. Um, I was faced with carrying out an independent study project for the TL1107 module as part of the PG cert and I decided to test my theory or the theory that my past experiences in the police helped to enhance the learning um, for the students at the university. And it also gave the students a chance to voice their own opinions. Was it actually effective uh, or not? I carried out a, an online survey or a survey monkey of nine questions and I sent out the survey to uh, 218 students uh, over four courses that I, um, I was involved in teaching. There was 218 there. Um, first year course, Fame and Deviant, second year, Introduction to Criminal Justice, third year, Police and Policing, Police Work, and then the fourth year module, Contemporary Critical Issues in Criminology. Uh, I submitted an ethics application, obviously, through the school, which was granted and um, the students were given the opportunity, obviously, it was anonymous, and uh, if they didn't want to engage in the survey, then they just didn't do it. I received 72 responses, which I thought was quite good, 33% um, of the response rate. The gender split is indicative of the modules taught. There was a vast majority of female students, 41 females, which was 70%, or just over 70%. Uh, 15, 15 males replied, which was about 25%, and two prepared not to say what their gender was, and obviously the 14 skipped the question. These are two uh, degree programmes which uh, the students actually came from Criminological Studies and Social Science, EA, and two others. So, um, one of the first questions that I asked was, have you had experience of being taught at the university uh, by a the lecture with practical the practitioner experience? I had uh, 69 responses, of which 58, 81.16% uh, said that they had been taught by a lecture with previous experience in the subject area. Uh, nine had been taught by a lecture with current experience, which I found quite strange. And also four had been taught by lectures with no experience, so I felt then that I was uh, actually feeling quite dramatically. Many times I've told them I'd be in the police. 
However, <laughs> um, we don't have no team, so I don't take it personally. <laughs> Based on the experiences, the response were asked to answer the, the question, how important do you think it is for a university uh, lecturer in the following subjects to have experience as a practitioner? Um, and this was the importance of practitioner experience. It was great. Um, one not important, up to five, extremely important. And along the bottom there are criminology, <coughs> policing studies, penology, sociology, criminal justice, criminal psychology, public health and forensic science. And it's fair to say that the, the majority of all students uh, said that it was, it was either four important or five very important or extremely important for all of the, the different topics there. The mean weightings of the subject area shows that every, uh, for every subject, uh, the mean weighting was over three, so 3.1 being over sociology, and policing studies were over a four. So you can see there that uh, they did think it was uh, important for experience to be had. We further asked the question, um, in what ways do you think the engagement practitioner led teaching informs and supports your learning? And the students were given three text boxes to record their answers um, to, me, to give some like, anecdotal evidence. Three key thematic areas came out of the survey. Experience, better understanding, and insight are also interesting. I'll leave each one in turn. Um, for the, the experience, the key issue, uh, the religious experience was a central facet of the uh, of the responses. Um, the personal experience in the subject matter helped students better understand what, was, what real life was actually like in relation to the academic teaching. And by that I mean um, the lecturer could put their experiences in relation to the academic <coughs> uh, to make it more interesting, hopefully make it more interesting. We also felt that that added value to the, to the teacher, or to the student learning in the classroom by making the lectures and tutorials more interesting and engaging for the students to help inform and support the learning through that experience. Some of the respondents indicated through the anecdotal evidence, um, first-hand experience helps to give a sense of what it is actually like in practice. They are able to put their teachings into real, real life by the use of examples. And I feel that my lecturers are able to put a theory for example, it's a real life context, I've been able to understand it more and helps me remember it because it may be an experience I can relate to. And also past experience is allowed for an anecdotal discussion, which can lead into a good, good exploration of topics. And finally, in the last one here, um, they felt that it was personally found more engaged in classroom activities. The second area that uh, came out of the respondents uh, from the survey was this better understanding and insight. And they felt that the, the real life experiences helped them to help provide this better understanding. And one of the respondents said, yeah, I feel that having a lecture led by a past practitioner allows for practical experience to be applied by theories which allows for an easier understanding. And also, the number of topics I have studied have been very abstract and difficult to understand in a practical sense. So hopefully, um, by providing this better understanding and insight, this uh, made things a bit easier for us and more interesting. Um, the previous experience that they felt was that can make the lectures more interesting. <coughs> it did throw up some interesting comments uh, from my negative side, and one of which was bias, which um, may have a tendency to peek through during lectures. In certain circumstances, the knowledge being passed on may become biased through certain actions that may have happened throughout the practitioner's experience. I'd probably like to be talking about the Scotland in a negative light, but I can't help it. Um, negativity will only be present should such a lecturer have bias towards an aspect of the course and or job in question. So these were quite important points which came up uh, from a negative sense that allowed me to personally reflect on how I actually delivered some of the teaching. The negative point here, um, sometimes I felt that the lecturer may have, may, may have uh, this overinflated idea of what they understood. We, we might have been talking about certainly some aspects of the, the lectures that um, I was making assumptions that they actually knew more than what they did do. And 
also, speaking about past experiences, there's a tendency to wander off. Um, wander off so it's quite, it's quite hard and quite interesting to, uh, to realise that yes, you can actually talk quite a lot. Um, so it's pulling it back to make sure that we can actually get the learning aids and objectives uh, at the end of the lecture. We also um, looked at research led or should a lecture be research active? And as it's quite clearly here, um, 28 said it was important and 26 of the students said it was extremely important for the lecture to be research active. Uh, and by um, helping understand what the, the areas of research was and applying that to the teaching. So that's quite important. I will touch on some of the conclusions, um, the importance of a previous experience uh, was support to the students, that providing them with a better understanding and insight, and also up-to-date knowledge, which then puts pressure on the lecture, that they have to remain up-to-date. Um, I left at least six years ago and things have changed and moved on rapidly since then, so it's up to me to make sure that I am up-to-date with current, uh, current issues. It helps to engage or help students to engage more in the class, and, but we also need to be careful of this bias and offering our own opinions and not colour students' views and also not one day not copy. And finally, um, it's important that we balance research with teaching duties and also it's very important that communication, communication skills are central to everything that lecturers do. Uh, if you cannot impart the knowledge in a, a meaningful way, then we're um, Basically, I would be wasting my time. Also, realise that real life occurrences can have a positive impact on student learning experience. And also, this teacher knowledge consists of more than pedagogical knowledge. Real life context can influence application theory and practice. And finally, I kind of realise my professional experience can actually enhance student learning experience. It contributes to the, the other attributes of being confident thinkers, determined creators and flexible collaborators and ambitious inquirers. And it provides a better and enhanced learning experience for students. And I think that is my, the main point that I found out of my uh, project. And just a couple of slides about it. That's it. Um, we're going to take questions to the three presenters uh, when the following three presentations, if that is OK. So thank you very much, William. That was I'd like to invite Lisa Gardner to come up and share with us the presentation. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, so for uh, those that don't know me, my name is Lisa and I'm the academic librarian for the Dundee Business School. Um, my action research project was on using problem-based learning to teach copyright compliance. Mm. <laughs> so the, um, the module I'm involved in is a first-year core business module, um, NT720. Um, which is Adopt a Company, and it's um, led by Charlie Malone. And my initial um, involvement in this module was actually because of an Atlas project a couple of years ago on digital storytelling. In this module, the students work in groups, and as part of um, a portfolio of assessment, each group has to create two videos, and the videos are on third sector organisations. The students have got a lot of freedom in terms of how they um, create their video, um, so they can create it all entirely from scratch, or they can incorporate um, other people's material like video clips or audio or images. So my involvement is to provide copyright training, and I do that in week two um, in the tutorial slots. <coughs> so. What's the issue with this module? Where was the potential for some improvement? Essentially, uh, when students are reusing other people's material, they've got some copyright issues. Um, and what I'm talking about is third party copyright compliance, which is super dull, I appreciate it. But the approach I took hopefully made it a little bit more interesting. So essentially, students, if they're using other people's material, have to show that they've got permission to reuse and in this case to rework that material um, and best practice would also be for the students to then um, apply a license to their finished video that would indicate the copyright um, status of the item. Last year the class I banned was very um, traditional. Um, it was a 
a lecture, a very short lecture, followed by hands-on um, activities exploring copyright um, in, with reference to Creative Commons, very much a focus on Creative Commons licences. Um, I thought the craft class went great. The students were really into the activities. They were based on card games, so it was very light-hearted. And um, through the activities, I really felt that the students had grasped how Creative Commons works. I'm a big fan of Creative Commons because the license makes it really clear what you can and can't do with the material. So I thought this would be ideal. <coughs> thought the class went great. And um, as a rule, the academic librarians, we don't take um, evaluations of our classes. We just use, you know, um, kind of anecdotal evidence. So I thought it went well. And then um, when I looked at the final videos, the compliance rates were pretty low. And I was quite disappointed. <laughs> um, so across the two videos, quite low levels of compliance. And all the groups that complied, um, none of them used third-party material. So they all achieved their compliance by just avoiding that and just creating everything from scratch. None of the groups attempted to license their final video as well. So I kind of thought, oh God, what am I going to do um, to improve the situation? You may wonder why it even matters. It's coursework. Why does it matter if students are infringing copyrights? Um, there are exceptions for education, so students can use fair dealing. Um, anyone can use fair dealing, so that allows you to use a small, reuse a small amount of copyright material for personal research without seeking further permissions. Um, however, that's a risky um, approach to take because it's open to interpretation. Who says what's a fair amount? Um, so the copyright holder can um, object to that. And also, you can't use fair dealing for commercial purposes. So if we're trying to encourage students to um, use real life scenarios, um, you can't really, it's not really fair to um, encourage them to rely upon fair dealing. There are reputational risks associated with breaching copyright for the student out and also for the institution. So in our context, it's difficult for the university to showcase what is otherwise excellent and creative student work if it infringes third-party copyright. Um, being able to ethically engage with um, intellectual property is certainly an employability skill. And in the commercial sphere, if you breach copyright, there are serious repercussions for both the employee and the employer. I think as well, obviously, it kind of chimes in with um, Abertee's graduate attributes. So, what did I think um, went wrong with that class last year? On reflection, I think there's going to be two main things that were a problem. The first was it was a first year class and they didn't have that basic understanding of copyright that I sort of assumed they would. And you do need that understanding, I think, before you can use the Creative Commons licenses. There was also an issue to do with timing because the class was in week two and that was just to do with um, timetabling restrictions. You only see the students once. And it was a long time before they were actually actively working on their video and then submitting it. So um, what could I do to <coughs> solve this? I decided to focus on three key changes. The first one was to change the focus of the class um, away from Creative Commons onto basically the fundamentals of copyright in the hope that that would then allow students to build upon that knowledge um, during, during the module. From observing the students in the class and from their final work, it was clear they did have a better grasp of copyright. Um, the final work had a higher um, level of compliance. Unfortunately, because the focus had been shifted from Creative Commons and third-party materials, there was um, less use of uh, third-party content in the final videos. The next thing I chose to change was the format of support materials. Um, Traditionally what I do, and it's very easy, is I basically just put up the uh, PowerPoint slides that I've used in the class and maybe add a couple of um, useful uh, web links. However, I was relying upon students essentially um, teaching themselves Creative Commons because the class was going to be on copyright basics. So what I did was I redesigned the materials um, in a dedicated section of the Blackboard module um, to be um, more suitable for self-directed study and made it bite size, uh, use more visual content to try and explain complicated processes. 
Looking at the Blackboard analytics, I can see that nine out of 14 groups had, in fact, accessed the materials. This is where it's kind of difficult to draw any conclusions. Um, it did appear that there was a link between the groups who accessed the materials and a higher rate of compliance. However, just because people have accessed the material doesn't actually mean they've used it. And the group that had the best use of third-party material and the most compliant um, did not access the area of Blackboard at all. So I can't really draw any conclusions about that. The major change that I made was moving to a problem-based um, scenario in the class. And I chose that because I hoped it would give students the greatest opportunity for deep learning and a chance to focus on copyright in its kind of widest sense. So how the class worked was um, students were in their groups. Each group had access to a computer. Um, at the start of the class, the um, activity was explained to them. Um, they were tasked with working on copyright to consider all the different kinds of copyright um, issues that they might come up against when creating the video. And the output was a checklist, a copyright checklist, which each group had to share with the class before the end of the class. And the students were also informed that I would take those checklists and merge them into a super checklist that I would put up on Blackboard and the whole module could then use that resource to help them in creating their videos. There was definitely an increase in engagement in the class because they were focused on um, a real activity that had a tangible output <coughs> that was going to be useful not just to them but to the whole module. And there was also a sense of kind of ownership because they were co-creating the item. Uh, because they had to report back within the hour, there was a sense of immediacy, so they definitely were focused on on what they were doing. Um, I sort of monitored what was going on and I used prompt cards to ensure that they considered all the points because not everyone stumbled across Creative Commons by themselves. And so just to make sure there was some scaffolding there to ensure that they covered all the kind of key points um, that I thought was important. So overall, there was an increase in copyright compliance, however, a decrease in the use of third party content. And there was no change at all in terms of relicensing. No students attempted to license the videos. So the increase in compliance was um, for both videos. I think part of that was because students were avoiding using third-party content. Um, just sound disappointing. So I think uh, next year, I mean, the problem-based approach was excellent. I, I really enjoyed it. I think the students did as well. Copyright is super dull. Um, so anything that can be done to make it more interesting. Um, what I realized, though, is that students really need both the copyright basics and the Creative Commons knowledge um, to really raise their level of compliance and their copyright literacy. And that's too much to do in one hour. Um, it's just, it just would not be uh, practical. So what I'm hoping to do next year is to um, flip the classroom and uh, get the students to do the copyright basics before the class and then in the class would be when, again, using a problem-based approach, um, they could uh, apply that knowledge to, um, to the practical selection and use of Creative Commons materials and hopefully that will um, increase the students' copyright literacy and also um, raise the level of compliance in their coursework. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now I'd like to invite Alberta to give the third and final presentation. Uh, this afternoon, and then we'll have a question and answer opportunity after Alberto has spoken to us. Okay, first of all, thank uh, to all of you to come here for during this busy period of marking, so it's very kind, appreciated. So, I explain uh, my project that was uh, to understanding the influence of uh, the social media technology to enhance the student learning, student engagement, and student performance. So, <coughs> why social media, social network? First of all, I would say that are widely used from the students and from mainly 90%, I can say 90% of the population that are in a developed country. So, are a free tool free tool to use that I already use it for sharing material with the friends, to stay in contact with the friends, I love to communicate with the, their parents. Uh, they just need to register, create a profile, log in and start to interact. Okay. 
uh, allow them to pu publish uh, posts like uh, links, uh, video, uh, or images. So they are just a, a community. So we think to use this kind of community in our coursework, in our, uh, in our models. So how was the methods that we have? We used the two, three Facebook group mainly. Um, in uh, our models is uh, human physiology, okay, last year and this year. So we used Facebook. So we developed first a big Facebook group where all the students of the class were joining and also all the, tu the tutors of, uh, of this model were joining this uh, group. And considering that the class is generally divided in two, three groups for, for having the tutorials, we have several subgroups. The class was uh, running as a problem-based learning, so this, the group were subdivided in small little group. So what are the meaning of this uh, two type of group? So in this one, the student were posting their tutorial output. Okay, so these groups were closed. So it means that the group, the student that were joining this group here was not able to see the posting of uh, the student in this group here. So it means they were not influenced from their tutorial output. But in this group, all the students were able to see all the posts. Okay, so what is it the meaning, the meaning of this group here? Because we were asking to the student to work and to have a, make a small research on some topic related, of course, to the material that we were uh, delivering lecture, for example, on uh, the role of the antioxidants. Uh, and we were also asking to put a, a short paragraph and a picture in order, because for us, also, the researching, googling a picture that match their uh, uh, paragraph is a way to internalize better some information and also is a better way to keep the attention of uh, the other peers that are joining in this group. So, uh, these are some examples. This is uh, an example in the, in the total group where we are, we are asking a student some uh, output. Okay. And this student select a couple of nice pictures. Or in this case uh, was just a student always in the total group but without any input from the tutor. She just uh, feel free to share a material. This in this case was a movie and uh, say to the student says to the other peers, look this movie because it's very interesting for is a um, sub subject related to the to the to the course. Okay. And in this case, was just the tutorial output posted in the subgroup. Okay, so of course, uh, Facebook gives you the possibilities to make a comment and uh, to read how many members have read that uh, post. Okay, so how we analyze it, the performance and the engagement? First of all, we made a questionnaire. Okay, questionnaire, focus group, uh, and statistical analysis. The questionnaire were basic divided in two main sections. One section was uh, an overall, um, overall impression on the Facebook uh, group and, and this, on this kind of learning uh, tools. And other part of the questionnaire was more in depth to understand if there were some obstacles uh, or what could be done to have a better improvement. Okay, of course, as, as I said, focus group, and see. So let's see the results. Okay, so on overall impression, we can say that all of them were positive. We used the, the court uh, of last year's, so means that after one year, we want to have a retrospective uh, analysis so after one year, the student, what they think, and also the current academic year student. So, so what are they are thinking about 
this kind of a learning technique. So they say that they read it, the material of the Facebook and group, and they feel more better prepared and also help them to better understand the subject matter. Overall, they say that this Facebook uh, learning tool is uh, worth doing. Okay. And could be also more effective than normal, normal lecture styles. So, but what could be also some obstacles that they <coughs> find in this kind of learning process? We develop some other questions and to submit to the students. As we can see, we can see slightly difference between the two courses of students. So, a nice case are these two here. So, last year student says, because other members does not participate, are not very well engaged. This is uh, something that uh, is not very well maybe related to the Facebook <coughs> group, but uh, maybe it could be more related on the problem-based learning. Okay, so always you have someone that, that is very straightforward student and some other one that they, they maybe go a little bit slower. And other student says, because the works of a Facebook is not graded, is not adapted to my grade. So this is something that we are thinking how we can develop a grade. But of course, we were measuring also the um, we were grading in a way because uh, the output for the students were also subject of mini quizzes. So if they were able to answer the mini quizzes, it means that they read the output of our Facebook. So that was kind of a way to grade them. So what was the improvement that could be done for uh, this kind of learning technique? Again, we say it. They say, let's be easy with other commitments. So, welcome in our words, okay? So, uh, better commitment for the other group members. But of course, if you start to grade them, maybe they will be more engaged. Because here the students, if they are not graded, maybe they don't want to work so much. So, they want, some of them, they want to have longer time to post Facebook, okay, and some of them, they want also increasing the quality and uh, input also from, uh, from, the, from the lecturer, from the tutor. So, but at the end, said, so given the chance, most of them, they will prefer to join this, uh, in the future, this kind of tools. Okay, some of them, of course, they say, not sure, because of course, some things need to be fixed, and just low percentage, they say, no, of course. So, focus group, we recorded of, on the base of 12 members, we recorded the, um, the session and after we rewrite down, so in order to future analysis. So, the question were, do you feel more engaged when you use Facebook, when you use Facebook? They said, yeah, first of all, it's easier to get message. Okay, is uh, get information because you get notification every time and everywhere. They said it helps in the understanding, especially with the good good use of picture and the diagrams. This is something that's very something that appears every time. This kind of answer. So we also asked what was the main difference between uh, Facebook and Blackboard. What do they feel? So first things they said. The, we prefer the use of Facebook because you get a notification very easily. But in Blackboard, you need to log in and because they are, if they use their mobile phone and they don't have the apps that uh, they need to log in and they need to get the notification. But they generally use Facebook for daily, so and they, they just get the notification. And some students, they told me, they told us that if you have a poor signal, if you stay with a mobile phone and you have a poor signal, the Facebook apps consume less data. But if you want to log in using the regular browser like Chrome Explorer um, in a poor signal, 
you will have very difficult, will be very difficult to log in. So, some negative aspect was that at this stage, the um, Facebook group was not uh, organized in subfolder. So sometimes to see information from uh, the beginning of the model, they need to scroll back to find that information. For me, it was fine because, okay, even in scrolling back, see the picture, you have also something that enter always in your brain. But that was for them kind of a negative aspect. So do you feel that uh, Facebook helped you to work in a group? No. Because they said they already work in the group for the tutorial, so this was not an helping to work in the group, okay? But some students say it's a useful tool, and we feel that it's a personalized learning. Because it's personalized, they feel that it's on their own level. Could be high, could be low, it's something like a clue made on their shape, okay? So, and this, they said that it's very nice because after the continuous feedback from the tutor, you can re-edit the post. Other tools, other learning tools, you need to repost your output. Okay, you just go change and after the, the post and save also sometimes. So, if they, in, this tool encourage their learning process, they said yes, Graphic diagrams and videos selected from the tutor were very helpful to understand the subjects. And if this can later help better to understand also the subject, they said it's very important for peer learning, okay, but of course some more feedback and some more other uh, input from the tutor could be appreciated. This student here says uh, that sometimes if you know really the topic of the mini quizzes, it will be easier in a stand to scroll back just to go and Google it out. And, but this one, this is going out from uh, the scope. Student says short paragraphs are very easy to, to read, they found very easy to read and, and to follow. So let's see statistical analysis. We run the statistical analysis between the student engagement, so measured how many times they read the post, and uh, the score, the overall score of mini quizzes. We, see, we find a, a weak correlation, but not significant, in the two mini quizzes, in nutrition mini quiz and metabolism mini quiz. This is mainly due because we used a very small, just from this year, a very small. Um, uh, student subject, so, the, so that's why the study need to be wider. So, concluding, we can say that this tool, the students, especially the young generation, are very familiar with this tool. It's free to use from, from the university, okay, it's already established tool. The students, they feel engaged with this kind of tools. There is a weak, very weak relation, but of course, need to be maybe done also as a limiting factor with other cohort of students because we have run this just for biomedical science students so we, maybe we can try to use this kind of tool also for engineering and uh, criminology whatever so and also some limiting factor maybe to Im improve and increase the peer engagement that the post need to be graded and we can try to find a solution also for this. So in summary, we have a good insight to use this kind of tool and this kind of techniques also for in our uh, models. Thank you very much for your attention.
<laughs> That's a simple question, simple answer, no, I didn't actually break it down into the group groups. In terms of students' perceptions to relevant to Yeah. It's, um, no, I didn't do that for that for that survey, but it's something that could, it, it can be replicated, uh, and it's maybe something worthwhile uh, to gauge students' perceptions as they go through university through, well, through first through to fourth year, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I've had quite a few students. The, in criminology, there's always students who want to join the police. Um, so I have had, and also, not just the police, there's other criminal justice agencies, um, for instance, there's criminal justice social work. So they have been talking to us regarding, or talking to me personally, regarding criminal justice employment opportunities. Not just the police, but uh, yeah, and certainly in fourth year, they have, there's one or two students who are moving on, one going into criminal justice social work, a couple going into the police. Uh, so it's, it's maybe, that's a good point. It's maybe worthwhile looking at over maybe the next year or two. Yeah. want more time than I'm given. I think that if there, if there was more class time it would only be beneficial if it was spread out more during the module because that would then answer this problem of the time lapse. So I could see a scenario where you have maybe the copyright basics at the beginning and then closer to when the students are actually actively working on the video, having <coughs> more class time looking at um, the practical applications of Creative Commons, so I could see that. Um, but in reality, I know that's probably not an option because the timetable is so tight. That's fine. Yeah, thank you. too much consuming but we want to be created as well for this kind of uh, other extra stuff, you know. Would there be scope for, instead of making the Facebook group extra work, reducing perhaps contact time in class, uh, saying your tutorials are on Facebook? No, uh, the idea is to increase the peer learning and to get the student in in a, a tool that for them is more familiar. So it's kind of sometimes to learn from peers, you can have maybe a better internalization. For example, some, some comment during the, the focus group, they feel in this way they can, are able to learn more in this way. So they feel more comfortable in this kind of scenario. Uh, kind of yeah, that's what I'm saying. Instead of, instead of having Facebook learning as an addition I don't think so that is a, a reason for this is kind of, I don't think that is an extra work because always they need to work for the tutorial. So it's a way that where to post this uh, these things. Of course we were going to ask 
some other additional stuff, but it's always uh, our design of process of uh, level two. Okay, because we were going to having a, a feedback every time and you the time, you know. So the kind of is our design to be this kind of level two. So instead to make lecture, sometimes lecture delivered from uh, the tutors, we were um, making some this small assignment to the to the students and to help them engage more. Can we take a question from all and then ask if that's okay at all? I just wanted to know your students already had uh, a Facebook account to begin with, more than one Facebook. Hmm? Yeah. Well, they were on Facebook. And were they willing when they joined the group? Did that make their, like, their profile viewable to the rest of their class? Or is it just kind of close group? This is up to the students. For example, myself, I have two accounts. One of my account and one from the university. So if you want to... Uh, so I set up already. I just wanted to know. Yeah, for my yeah. Friend. So, please, they say that there's no problem. There was just one student that after she just went uh, to from the university, but all of them is uh, no problem. At the beginning, they said, hey, that's going to be a little bit strange, but after they feel complete also, because always, so they are friends of each other, crazy yeah. in the classroom, and, uh, and the groups were closed, so people from that uh, were not members from the group were not able to see and we were not able even to see what the work of the people that we were trying to do, so they feel completely comfortable on this kind of thing. Thank you. Alistair? I'd like to actually ask a similar question about whether you ran into any issues of students uh, who didn't have a Facebook account or perhaps were not to use it, and I think you, you articulated that on the very well. Do you feel that, and again you did kind of answer this in your presentation, I'm just wondering to what extent Blackboard discussion forums, what's the value added of using Facebook vis-a-vis -vis a sort of more formal BLE? Uh, so, I think there is a lot of um, uh, added value to use this kind of tool because they are familiar, very familiar with this kind of tools. Okay, so this is something that Sometimes, you know, it's also to remove some barriers, okay, because if you are feeling to be a member of a community, a member of a community of peers, okay, maybe you can start to drop down some boundaries between the lecture and, uh, you know, and uh, the, the person that need to absorb to like a sponge the, the lecture material, okay? If you feel to be like an in, internal community, you can start to feel, it, especially learning from peers, maybe you are more open to internalize some uh, concept. That is uh, our idea. But I thought the students said it was more convenient to go through the Facebook thing. Yes, yeah. because they told Blackboard can be kind of to respond. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So whether that's part of the yeah. <laughs> yeah. How useful is Blackboard on a mobile phone? But you need to be also to be sure. I thought it was very Yeah, but it's sometimes very not always but you know, you generally you don't use Blackboard for every day. So that is the tool that the change yeah, generally uses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. There are no more questions. So thank our presenters again for, for fielding our questions. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted to see the audience and colleagues who are in the first year of the future program. So, you know, sort of their, these presentations have, have, have afforded the opportunity to see the three Pathfinders. So thank you to those three Pathfinders to, who have presented um, their work today. So two years of program interacting in this environment in effect. And next year's presenters getting a, an early foretaste of, of what's been achieved by this current cohort, which I think is really um, <coughs> been a very enriching experience, I think. If I may, I'd like to bring Eddie back to the back to the lectern because um, I think he wants to just uh, talk about you know moving on with with um, practice.
practitioner research at Abbott and, and, and how we might disseminate our work more widely. Thanks, Dave. Right then, we've got to a stage now where we're starting to build up a capability and you've seen just some of the stuff that's going on, there's pockets of what going on across the entire university. We get somewhere, we start to get the work, we've got ways of disseminating it and ultimately you end up with something potentially of really good quality and then left with the difficulty, where do I go next with this? I want to go outside, I want to do something, I want to think of this with this which done on. And why? And uh, what hurdles have we got to overcome? Does it matter if it has an impact rating or not? Where should I go? Should I go to do something specific in this or something more general? And a snapshot here just indicates, out of quite a lot, there's more than 30 there as a starting point. And then you've got to work out how long does it take. I've had one of mine sitting in the system in nine months and come back in basically two typos that admissions all the comment. So consequently, where do you go? How long is it going to take? And in particular, if you're starting to build up scholarly research, research and pedagogy, perhaps that's a really hard way to go about it. What other options do we have? Well, we have got an internal opportunity. We have professional practice in higher education, our own journal. But at the moment, that is currently the preserve of those on the PGCHE. That seems a bit exclusive, does it not? When we've got something sitting on our doorstep and a lot of good work that we've got going on in the university. So, we've got something we could start with. But what about in the future? How can we make best use of what we already have if we're developing the capability? Because this is a registered journal. It has a proper code. We can make more use of this. So, for the future, Really, we should open this up to all Abertay staff, and not just those on the PGCHE who've started to do really good work, get something done once, and then forget about it. Don't want to be like the students who've done an assessment and then take the box or a module and then move on. We want to think about, okay, we've done this hard work, how do we build on it? How do we keep that capability going? Because you've seen three examples today of some really good work. How can we build on that? How can we share it? So, we want something open to everybody and not just those doing it for the purposes of an assessment. There's other opportunities come from that, and in discussions with Alistair and various of us, there's opportunities for athletes. We have a choice. We could potentially publish wider if we choose, but if we're not going to publish wider, then why not internally publish the results? Not everybody's going to manage to go along to a presentation at conference, or some people might prefer to write up the detail of what they've got. So we could have special editions. And that might help with the ELA comment, more formalization of the results, start to tie things together so we can actually see an output and something coming from the work. It should also help us develop a search capability. Do we really know who else is doing anything similar elsewhere in the university? Once we start seeing people getting involved with things like this, our knowledge of who's doing what might be increased, so it's another aid to what the discipline and research and realising what's going on elsewhere. Unless of course you know you like me and go bother people and just open the door or wander in and such like and just find out what they're up to. So moving forward, we have now got a team together who are taking a key interest in promoting this online journal wider, making it more accessible. The early stages have already been put in place. So we are now for the next session thinking seriously about finding out how we're going to present this wider to the community, what else do we need to do to get people engaged with it, and this is the first stage, raising your awareness that once you've left the PGCHE group, those who are on it, there are opportunities to keep your work going, you don't just need to do something and forget about it. Some of the research we've seen today can be developed, publishable, and you don't want to publish outside, there's that. We may well be part of the session into the second year for some of you, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But certainly, there's opportunities for other people now to start showcasing what they're doing. And when it comes to, let's take for example, internal quality audits. 
the program's up for you. Are you one of the crews that you're doing something, engaging in such like? Well, if you've got some past conditions of case studies of your teaching and learning practices, a lot easier to find them from there, then it is to send that email out to the staff and you get more advice. So, an actual record of what's going on in your field. Quick to access, easy to find, what more could you ask for? Right then, that covers the key bits I've got there. Anybody want to ask any questions on that before I sit down? Yeah? I suppose two points. I mean, one is, uh, I think we should say that at the moment we're conscious that it's buried on the internet. So we've got aspirations to make it accessible on an external website. And so that it's not just, it's the wider sector that would have access to the papers. And I suppose the other one is just a, a bit of a, a, an open question about whether, for example, they should be peer reviewed. Elements of quality control, particularly if we did special editions. But my question to is yes, but yeah. there will have to be a wider yeah. discussion yeah. on the pros and cons. Yeah. Um, for example, what passes, what doesn't, etc. My personal view is it's not any value, it's got to be peer reviewed. No more questions? So I, I think I, I may respond to, to that. I think that is a really productive idea. I mean, just to, to give credit where credit's due, just like to acknowledge that it was Jude Leachman and um, Louis Tanson, both retired over the past year, who had the foresight and vision to create this internal online journal um, many years ago. Um, and and it, really was a, it really was a very ambitious and um, vision because they looking at with I'm aware of a comparable um, journal at um, King's, um, sorry, King's College London and you know we, we are right up there I think um, with leading institutions in terms of creating this type of internal um, outlook for, for pedagogy research findings I'm thrilled by his enthusiasm, and I think it says, you know, I think the notion of having a, a, a peer review panel before we commit work to to print it is is um, it's a strong idea. Is that what this? Yep. There's no other question. I'll sit down because I'm mindful now that people are starting to work out if that's the last thing. How can they get out the door? <laughs> you learn that one really quickly. Yes. Well, thanks again. Whoops. I think to draw things together, I think I just want to take the opportunity um, of, of um, the community, as it were, being here over this lunch time, just to. Um, in conclusion, to just provide an opportunity for conversation around each table, if that's possible. And I think you know we would welcome some feedback from from you, from dialogue on what we currently do um, in terms of promoting um, pedagogic research. Any areas of development that you feel that um, we should bring forward. And perhaps it might be an opportunity for you just to share um, together um, the strategies that you use in class, informally as well as formally, to evaluate your teaching. In the sense, I think the three presentations today um, showed a real high degree of um, critical engagement with evaluation, evaluation practice. And I think an opportunity to share one to another. Um, the methods and tools you use for evaluation would be a nice way to uh, round this seminar off. So would that be good? Is that okay? I ask you then to engage at your tables on those three, three areas. <laughs>